Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Broadband Association's Fiber for Breakfast. We're now in our third episode of 2024, and it's a balmy eight degrees outside, and I am counting down the days to summer. But before we kick off, I'd like to thank Wesco, the platinum sponsor of Fiber for Breakfast. You know, a government shutdown is looming once again with funding deadlines coming on January 19th, which is Friday, and February 2nd. You know, the Senate's begun making progress to pass legislation that's going to provide additional short-term funding to keep the government open for another month through March 2nd and March 8th, with hopes of finding a longer-term solution to fund the government. You know, avoiding a shutdown will be critical to the fiber industry as it allowed bead grants remain moving forward on what is already going to be a tight timelines for deployment. <laughs> You know, Speaker Johnson invited President Biden to deliver the State of the Union address on March 7th. You know, timing's interested, as this is going to be one of the latest State of the Union addresses in recent history. And that date also happens to be potentially the eve of another government shutdown. So everybody playing nice in Washington. Uh, with government funding in question, a top priority for FBA is additional funding being allocated for the Affordability Connectivity Program, ACP. Uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel announced the wind down of ACC, the ACP program last week and going to impact 22 million uh, recipients, current recipients of that program. And she anticipates this funding will run out in April. In response, a um, bipartisan legislation was introduced last week in Congress that will appropriate another additional $7 billion to keep ACP funded through 2024. FBA strongly supports this. Um, legislation called the Affordability Connectivity Program Extension Act Bill. The bill is introduced by Senators Welsh, Vance, Rosen, Kramer, and Representatives Clark and Fitzpatrick. And it'll fund ACP until the end of the year. So we encourage all impacted people and organizations to reach out to Congress and voice your support for this legislation. Our first regional Fiber Connect workshop is coming up on February 8th in Richmond. And we have an amazing lineup of speakers, including today's guest, Joy Winder from Treasury, and former FCC Chairman Ajit Pai. Registration for Richmond is now opening, are open, and the event is filling up very quickly. This is going to be uh, one of our biggest regional events yet. So you can register by going to richmond.fbaevent.org to register. Our other workshops, in addition to Richmond in February, is we have Little Rock in April. Deer Valley in Utah in um, June, Des Moines in September, Albuquerque in November, and of course our huge Fiber Connect 2024 conference in Nashville is July 28th to 31st. This will be the biggest fiber conference in the world, so you're not going to want to miss that. That brings us to today's Fiber for Breakfast session with Joey Winder, the director of the U.S. Department of Treasury's $10 billion capital projects fund. Who will speak with us today on making a down payment on the administration's goal of affordable, reliable, high speed internet for all. Before I formally introduce today's guests, I'd like to introduce David Norris from our team, who's going to walk us through some housekeeping items. Thank you, Gary, and good morning to everyone who has joined us. Uh, before I go over a few logistics here, I'd like to once again thank our platinum sponsor of Fiber for Breakfast, Westco. Now, if you would all please keep in mind, all participants are in listen only mode today ask a question, please type it into the question box located within the control panel on the side of your screen. We will host a Q&A session with our panelists at the end of today's session. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on FDA's website within 24 to 48 hours. You can find the recording in the events tab under the Fiber for Breakfast drop-down option. And at the conclusion of the presentation, you will be prompted to complete a brief feedback survey. Please take a moment to do so. We appreciate your input. And now I'll hand it back over to Gary to uh, once again introduce our panelists and get things going. Gary? Thanks, David, and good morning. I'm Gary Bolton, President and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. Last week on Fiber Breakfast, our guest was Tyler Cooper, the Editor-in-Chief of Broadband Now, in a session titled Broadband First, Access to Fiber Internet Surpasses 50% of U.S. Households, part of their new research. You know, Broadband Now has created some new algorithms that enable them to determine Fiber availability based on speed tests. It's a great session if you miss it, and so you can watch the replay or listen to the podcast. Today on Fiber Breakfast, our guest is Joy Winder, the director of U.S. Department of Treasury. It's $10 billion capital projects fund, who's speaking on making a down payment on the administration's goal of affordable, 
reliable and internet, a high-speed internet for all. Joey serves as the director of the Capital Projects Fund, overseeing the $10 billion program at the U.S. Department of Treasury and helping to ensure that all communities have access to high quality, modern infrastructure, including affordable, reliable, high-speed internet. He previously served for nearly 13 years on Capitol Hill, most recently as Senator Ed Markey's senior policy advisor, where he led a team covering a wide range of issues, including telecommunications and infrastructure. Joy also worked as then Representative uh, Markey's legislative director. And then prior to working for Markey, Wender served as counsel for the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. He received his BA from Wesleyan University and graduated magnum cum laude from Harvard University. So welcome, Joey. And for audience, please type in your questions that go, and we'll work them into the Q&A at the end. With that, I'll turn things over to Joey. Morning, Gary, and thanks for having me on. And just rest assured, the government is open today, and we are working. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go through my presentation relatively quickly, as I know the most exciting and important part of these, uh, these sessions is the Q&A. I do want to start before I move on to the next slide to mention that we are, to give context here on two levels. One, as Gary alluded to earlier, and I know is a topic that, that, that is discussed all the time on this call, on these sessions, I should say, on Fiber for Breakfast, is that this is an historic moment, right? This is an historic time, right? There's never been a moment where tens of billions of dollars in funds across multiple agencies are being deployed to close the digital divide once and for all. And another way of saying that is there may never be another time in which tens of billions of dollars are being deployed across the federal government to achieve the Biden administration's goal of affordable, reliable, high-speed internet for all Americans. And so we, we are living in an historic moment and it is exciting which makes, but it makes our jobs and our tax that which that much more important because we have to get it right at this time. The other thing is I want to give context to specifically the money at Treasury. So I think most of your listeners by now understand that the Treasury money predates the bipartisan infrastructure law. It came first because it was part of the American Rescue Plan which is one of the, the few COVID relief bills that Congress passed during the height of the pandemic. And the reason why Congress specifically put $10 billion in the rescue plan as a down payment on making internet, high-speed internet affordable and reliable for all Americans is because the pandemic truly was the national teaching moment. Now, Gary, all of your members knew, I knew that internet was essential. High-speed internet is essential for the, for the economy, for work, for education, for healthcare. But the pandemic really put that into sharp focus very fast, very quickly. And Congress being a stimulus response organization, right, reacted to the pandemic and there was finally enough pressure and enough focus on broadband that congress began funding it in a large amounts in the rescue plan obviously then they followed it with a much larger amount um, in the bipartisan bill you know in the form of bead and others which will allow us to make it all the way to universal connectivity but i think it's important to understand why our fund exists in the context in which it was created. So let's go on to the next slide. So in short, the legislation set the allocations for uh, the Capital Projects Fund. They were set uh, by population and in some way weighted based upon poverty and rural areas. And the most important thing to note here is that we decided there were three presumptively eligible uses for the Capital Projects Fund. Broadband, digital connectivity, and multi-purpose community facilities. Because all three of those projects, all three of those efforts do contribute to bringing connectivity to all Americans. Now let's go on to the next slide. 
we know that the vast majority of funds are going to be used of the 10 billion for broadband. And I think the key requirement to keep in mind with respect to our funds, well, there's two key requirements. The first is that we were the first federal agency to require 100 symmetrical. Now, some people said, well, does that mean you're favoring fiber? Well, the standard is, techno is technology neutral. However, we know this will result in a large amount of fiber deployment. And that is a good thing. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on fiber for breakfast. The idea is we wanna make investments that not, don't last just years, but last decades. You know, we talk about future proofing. We talk about future proofing because it relates to what I said at the beginning of this call. We're not gonna get tens of billions of more dollars in a few years to, to do a do-over or redo this or upgrade. And so that's why you know, putting fiber in the ground, I think is, or putting fiber on poles is so important because it can, it can absorb or it can reflect whatever the capacity needs are now and moving forward. The other thing I would note here is that projects must be done by 2026. We have a tight timeline and we'll get to that in a second, but it, the result is that we are seeing construction underway and complete in many states around the country, which is just terrific. And ultimately that's the ultimate goal of what we're attempting to do here. So let's move on to the next slide. Here's where we are now. Of the 10 billion, we've approved over nine. That's in all states and DC. And we know based upon what states tell us that that's gonna reach at least 2 million locations. That's 2 million locations that will get affordable, reliable, high-speed internet before 2026. Let's go to the next slide. So within that total, we know about three quarters at this point are for broadband. So that's nearly all states and Puerto Rico. Obviously the rest of the money being used for multi-purpose community facilities, for anchors, which as we all know are connectivity hubs in so many neighborhoods and also targeted in many low income places where people you know, need to be able to go there for, for digital navigators and digital skills and the rest. We'll go to the next slide. I put that we've got two slides here on examples of projects that we are funding. The key thing to keep in mind is that when people say, wow, Joey, isn't it cool you run a $10 billion program? I say, I don't really run a $10 billion program. I, I oversee 50 of them, right? There's really 50 different approaches. It's a bottoms up program where states are the driving force. You know, states are deciding how to address the critical need that exists in their states. So in some places, we've got large scale build outs and other places, there are much smaller line extensions. In some places, if we wanna to go to the next slide, like Maryland and New York, we're wiring multi-dwelling units. And the important thing to note is that we do not favor incumbents. We don't favor competitors. We don't favor munis. We don't favor co-ops. We want an all of the above approach. These are all competitive programs and we're, that are reflecting in the end, a market failure. We're, no, we're going to places where the market has decided they didn't wanna go. And that's why the federal government is spending all this money to subsidize CapEx. And so we don't wanna limit you know, the types of ISPs that are able to bid. We want it to be open to all. And so that we explicitly encourage and require in our in our guidance. You know, the final thing I'll say here, and then I'll open it up to questions, is, you know, this is really a case where, and this is hard to admit, you know, sitting here in, in the ivory tower in the Treasury Department, right? DC doesn't know best, right? We wanted to create a flexible program that again allowed states to curtail, to develop to implement program plans that fit the needs in their state. You know, it, it, it's obvious the needs in Kansas are different than Maine, than Maryland, than, and Minnesota because of topography, because of the suite of providers that exist, because of the service that already is there, because of the cost of build out. 
right? So it wouldn't make sense to have a one size fits all approach. And I think ultimately that's why Congress created our program in the way that it did. And that's why our program is gonna be so successful because we're creating this flexibility and we're pushing states to finish and requiring them to finish build out by the end of 2026. And so with that, if you wanna take down the slides and Gary, I'm happy to answer any questions, except if someone asks me what's the percentage chance the government shuts down, I have absolutely no response to that. Even though I worked on the Hill for 13 years, I've learned never to predict the actions of Congress. Well, Joey, thank you so much. And you know, the work you're doing is just amazing. You know, the one thing that I really uh, admire about you, appreciate about you, is how approachable you are. You know, when I see you at events and small ISPs will come up and you give me your card and you say, let me make an appointment. I mean, so uh, you probably are the most approachable guy with $10 billion I know. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you for, you know, what you're doing for all the, our communities across the nation. So, you know, one of the things I think has really been critical with capital projects um, is, you know, any of these big programs, like, you know, we have the bipartisan infrastructure law and we're gonna have all these billions of dollars going, but yet no one's seen a dime, right? And it's been two years. And so you create a huge wait for it. So what capital projects really allowed is to keep the momentum going so yes. that while we work through the bead, so we have these projects going that you can fund Gumbo, you can fund Virginia, you can fund Maryland. And you know, with that, with ARPA, other ARPA money. So it's really enabled this momentum to keep going. So now that you're getting close to the end of your, your $10 billion um, bank account, uh, well, congratulations on that. I mean, that's firstly a huge job and how quickly you get that. But tell us more about your role moving forward and how you plan to work with state. Sure. So, you know, when people say, oh, you've approved all, you know, over $9 billion, what do you just, you know, put your feet up all day and just relax and watch television? Well, no, you know, there is, there, there is a heavy amount of compliance, reporting, implementation, you know, we require states to be reporting to us both quarterly and annually on their implementation. And we have a very strong, uh, important compliance regime. The other key piece to keep in mind, Gary, is that even though we've approved $9 billion, we haven't cut checks for $9 billion, right? These are, this we're running a reimbursement program. So states are being reimbursed by us to the extent to which they need to reimburse providers for work completed. You know, it's that's a quite simple, elegant way of maintaining leverage over states and providers to ensure that the work gets done. You know, I like to joke, Gary, if you if you paid someone, if you if you hired a contractor to build a deck on your house for 10 grand, would you give them 10 grand at the start and say good luck? No. I've done that before and uh, not, not seen them in that day two. <laughs> right, right. It wouldn't go well, right? So the whole point is these are milestone contracts and providers are paid in full at the end. And so that means our role is strong moving forward. That being said, again, I'm here to solve problems and resolve issues at the state level. You know, if a state comes to us with an issue, I want to be on, on the phone with that state broadband leader that afternoon, right? Time is of the essence, we cannot wait. And so if there are any issues or questions, our objective and our goal is to resolve them as quickly as possible so that work can proceed. All right, well, tons of questions coming in here. So let me um, start with a, a few of these. So I get a lot of questions about the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Um, so one of these questions here from one of my good buddies says requirement three of B concerns existing broadband funding programs. CFP broadband funding is relatively simple to ascertain. Uh, the SLFRF um, broadband funding is less so. Can you explain the differences between the two program reporting requirements to the states to the US Treasury? Sure, great question. So SLFRF, the State and Local Fiscal Relief Fund, was the $350 billion fund that was created also by the American Rescue Plan primarily driven by the need to fill in, you know, budget gaps that were, were hemorrhaging during, um, you know, the early part of the pandemic. 
Now, one of the eligible uses of SLFRF funds is broadband. And so as part of our um, voluntary agreement through our MOU with the FCC, the Department of Ag and Commerce, we have developed common reporting systems. And so whether it's a, a capital projects funded project or a state and local funded project, they are required as in states and localities required to tell us every location that is served. And every one of those locations is going to be on the FCC map for the whole world to see. So we just had a round of, of data uh, come in. We're expecting to send over some, uh, some of these locations to the FCC very soon, and they will be promulgated on the map. And so everyone will be able to see them. All right. Well, you also you know, started off with saying that Treasury was the first to go with 100 meg by 100 meg symmetric. And one of the questions came in, well, why is B doing 100 by 100? We were able to, we had flexibility given the flexible nature of our statute to choose that uh, speed standard. You know, beads statutory requirements are longer and more strict. And so, you know, they had to, they had to interpret uh, their statute as they saw fit. Yeah, I was actually, so the White House had invited me. Yeah, to answer that question. I, you know, I, what, 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 that's, that's all I can say. Well, the White House had invited us in before they announced um, the whole infrastructure bill. And we're, and basically they had presented it as 100 by 100. And what happened is the wireless guys went ballistic saying, are you saying that um, wireless is not going to participate? And so this became a big compromise. And, and that's really, you know, um, my friend Chris Alley likes to say broadband's about people until it's not and then it's about politics and unfortunately that became a political football which fortunately for ntia the brilliance of ntia is they were able to navigate around that and really prioritize fiber so that saved a lot of communities from having the wrong networks built uh, so one of the other questions came in is now you've, you've allocated nearly nine billion how much have you reimbursed so far over a half a billion our outlays so, are over half a billion, and but they're in, and they're increasing exponentially week over week. Right as we get to twenty twenty six and so forth. Yep. All right. And you're going to see a lot more, and I should say, a lot of states and a lot of providers are pushing towards construction starting when the ground thaws this spring. And how do you oh, see? Hopefully it thaws soon. What's that? Which hopefully it thaws soon. It's very cold today. <laughs> How do you see funding the OPEX in low density subscriber areas to make new internet, uh, in, you know, internet services more available and affordable? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Look, our program is a CapEx only program. It is, it is, it is explicitly for capital assets. And so, you know, that's really on the provider to determine how they're gonna make the business case. You know, what we can do to, to sweeten the pot, right? Is to provide that CapEx help. All right, um, my, my dinner buddy here is uh, asking a crystal ball question. So uh, in 10 years, when we look back at it and pat ourselves in the back, you know, how we got it all right and, you know, how we bridged the gap, are there things that we could have done better? What would we regret about these funding efforts, including CFP? And what, what do you think we could do better collectively as a government and country? For our program, nothing. It's perfect. But for no, I, I think, look, I, I think what, well, I'll say two things. One, I think there will be lessons learned because there will be 50 state efforts here. Like inevitably, some states will be incredible and will do an amazing, awesome job. And inevitably, there will be some states that will not be as awesome. Right, and so you're gonna have a lot of different comparisons and a lot of different studies to make about certain states did it one way and others did it another way. I mean, it just that's just inevitable. There will be a range of outcomes. I think the overall will be wildly positive because it is not a one size fits all approach, but this will, you know, researchers and analysts will have, uh, will have a lot of data to, to determine, you know, which, which, which approaches were the most effective. 
I will say, I mean, this is a great opportunity, Gary, to put a plug in for the ACP, right? I mean, if a crystal ball, I would say, or a regret or lessons learned, I think if the ACP were to go away, right? I, I, I think that would be a real detriment to our program, to Bede and others. Like, look, we require ACP participation by all providers. We think it's very important. And the loss of ACP not only means the loss of internet, of affordable internet for millions of Americans, but it also you know, impacts providers as well. And so when I'm thinking about the most important thing right now in Congress, obviously, other than funding the government, you know, I, it's extremely important for Congress to fund the ACP. And we fully, we fully support the White House's um, call for an additional six billion for the ACP. You know, that's a great point. You know, what seems to be the trend is this political brinkmanship in DC. And April 8th is kind of the key date. If we don't get this program funded before April 8th, we have burned the trust of 22 million Americans that we're going to rip off this program. So even if funding comes after April 8th, what's our chance of going to low-income America and saying, we're not going to screw you again. Come on back. Come on back. We're, we're not going to pull the rug out from under you. I mean, it just, it really is 22 million Americans that, were, that the most critical segment, what we're trying to do, this whole program is about these, this segment that we're trying to buoy up to be able to have the same advantages that people have in large cities and have opportunities to jobs and education and healthcare, and we're screwing with them. And um, it's and the best thing about ACP, it's a self-correcting program. As people can come on it and have access to better jobs and opportunities in education, right. they <laughs> lift themselves out of the program. And so it disappears on its own. So if we can just keep it going long enough for everybody to buoy up. Anyway, I'll get off my ACP horse, but it is very frustrating to see, you know, these things riding down to the last second. And, uh, you know, we got to fund this bill. Um, so anyway, I'm glad you brought that up, but. Yeah, that was right. mutual. Thank you. So tell me about, so now that, you know, you have the wisdom of the CFP wisdom, I'll call it. What lessons do you have for providers and other industry stakeholders? I think the most important thing is that is that you can and you can see it already again because you see 50 different programs the states that prepared early the states where the state broadband offices were talking with the providers were talking with the other stakeholders with the associations those are the states that are going to be the most successful and those are the states that are moving the quickest right it's not a surprise that louisiana was first to be awarded by BEAD, they were the first to be awarded by us, along with Virginia, West Virginia, and New Hampshire, right? The, sta the, the star students remained the star students, and there's a reason for that. They had a plan, right? And they were in coordination and talking to one another. So, you know, the more that all of your members are talking to state broadband offices, the better. Look, this is, we're in a new world, right? There's really not four entities or three entities or two and ag and FCC and, and commerce doing, you know, uh, broadband and now treasury. There's those four plus 50, right? Every state has a huge stake in the game right now as a huge part of whether there's going to be a successful build out of all of this deployment of this broadband. And so the more you're talking to states, the sooner you're talking to states, the better. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned Louisiana, uh, Beneath and Thomas, you know, so when we did our first regional event a couple of years ago, um, Beneath raised his hand and said, come on down Louisiana, come down to Baton Rouge, because uh, we are going, you know, we got gumbo, which, you know, I thought he meant seafood sure. gumbo, but um, right. they're talking about something else. <laughs> but uh, no, he said, come on down, because uh, we are going to be first out of the gate. We're, we're you know, so they, from day one, they were going to be number one. And when I would talk to Northwest Louisiana, I was shocked their entire parishes that don't participate in the internet. I mean, it's hard to believe in this time and age. So I'm really glad that uh, Beneath and Thomas and the guys down in Louisiana are off to the races and they get Paul Louisiana up to be, you know, from last to first. So that is awesome. So, 
so tell me a little bit about um, the, so when you're looking at, you know, we see with um, bead, there's a lot of angst around, you know, the reimbursement and uh, also the 25% match and things like that, that disadvantage smaller providers or perceived disadvantage smaller providers. Uh, tell me about the CFP. How does that work? You know, so you have a reimbursement program. So are smaller providers disadvantaged by that? No, I don't think so. Well, first of all, we have no match requirement. Let's just say that we have no match requirement. And all that. We have no letter of credit requirement, right? You don't want to create barriers for participation by ISPs. I talked about that at the beginning of this program, right? We want to make sure that all providers have an opportunity here, big and small, public, private. In terms of reimbursement, the reimbursement is 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 a matter of days, right? A state will request money from us and we turn it around within days. So this is a, you know, when, when a state is in full compliance, they're sending them us all their reports, they're giving us all the information we need to pay, we can turn those around almost immediately. So I don't think there's any disadvantage or any impact on any provider. Well, Joey, CFP has been wildly successful so far and it looks like nothing but success going forward. So congratulations. You it couldn't be run by a, a better person. So thank you for everything you do. And I really want to appreciate, you know, as I mentioned, is the timing is so critical too to keep this fiber deployment rolling while we're waiting for the bead money to start um, coming out, which is starting to begin now. So that's great news. Great. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And look forward to getting back together next Wednesday. We're going to continue our monthly quantum series with Nicole Barbaras, the director at um, IonQ, to discuss hybrid quantum computing. So just the advantages by being able to merge classical computing and quantum computing can really provide some awesome benefits. So don't you don't want to miss that. We'll see you guys next Wednesday. Joey, thanks again. We'll see you in Richmond in a few weeks.